All right, welcome. Today I'm here with Kalila. I've known her for over five years. She's my next door neighbor. Um, when my husband and I were buying the home next door, we saw how we knew that we would love her from the beginning because her house is this beautiful aqua color and we knew we would get along. Um, when we first moved in, we were pregnant together and both planning home births, which only 1% of the population does. So I feel like that really like bonded us from the beginning. We had these shared values and desires. So um, yeah, I'm so excited to have her here. She's been such a blessing in my life. I love having our littles play together and just being there, creating that community right next door. Thank you so much for being here today, being willing to openly share your stories and experiences. You have so much wisdom and knowledge. So thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me. It has been amazing. I uh, painted my house those colors to attract the right neighbors. And it worked. Like it's so happy and free and they're my favorite. They just kind of speak to who I am. So it was perfect. I didn't realize the numbers for home birth were so low. So it is kind of a big deal that we were on the same page and so few of us choose to birth our babies at home to, um, you know, do it where we're most comfortable. But that definitely helped us to start building our relationship for sure. So I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Yes. Would you like to tell us a little bit about maybe your journey into the world of your mom birthing you? Do you know much of that? I do know a little bit of that. Um, one of the reasons why I chose or felt like home birth was right for me was because my mother birthed me at home right here in Spokane. Um, at the time, my mom chose to do more home births than hospital births because home births were cheaper. They were less expensive. And so um, she had birthed my older two brothers um, at home and chose to birth me at home as well at a little house across town from here. Um, and I had seen some pictures of some of my younger brothers after uh, home births with them. And I just thought it was really cool and powerful. So much power. I actually didn't learn a lot about birth until like the last decade, but as a child, I just thought how amazing it was that we can do this with our bodies and that my mother chose to do the birthing process mostly unassisted. Um, and with me, I was 44 weeks gestation um, when my mom birthed me. And back in the early 80s, I kind of just waited for like, baby's gonna come when baby's gonna come and my poor sweet little mother who's five foot one and was so so heavily pregnant still managed you know she waddled around until it was time and then birthed me peacefully at home um, and I think that that experience just like stuck with me somehow and made me yearn for the same experience of making my own decisions and using the strength that has been given to me. And so that was one of the big reasons why um, I chose to break my babies at home. Um, I wanted to be a mother like you since as early as I can remember. As young as I can remember, I was holding little tiny babies just like you. I, um, at church, for instance, 
there's a crabby baby and I'm like, I'll take it back to the baby room and I'll play with your baby. I'll take care of it. It'll be fine. And so I took care of other people's babies. I took care of my little brothers, um, younger cousins. And then of course started babysitting and in my later teens, I kind of ventured away from baby caring and cared for older adults instead. But I always had a stirring to be a mother. I want to be a mother. I want to use my body to grow babies. And then I want to use my body to nourish babies. Like this was always a thing. And I wanted a lot of them. Me I too. Did. Yeah. The reality of things is that once I got to that part of my life, um, I had my first at 32 and my second at 35. I realized that that was enough. Two was good. Um, two was a lot. In our modern day, not heavily supported motherhood times. Our culture just doesn't support mothering and caretaking as much as I had imagined as a child. And so my hope had been to have this big community, my parents around, my brothers around, so that people can help me with all these little tiny feet running around. But it wasn't like that. And so I had to find it in myself. Um, to build a little bit of that community, but I also postpartum found that with the lack of sleep, the hormones, um, some birth trauma with my first, that it was very difficult for me to ask other people for help. So postpartum with both of them, even with the second, when I was able to ask for help, was very, very difficult. And doing that twice was enough. And I knew deep down that I may not actually survive a third if, if I wanted one. So two it is, and two is lovely and perfect and amazing. Um, and not what I had imagined, but we live in a city and um, I feel like I would need more space, more outside space, barns and animals and all these things I had imagined as a child if I were to have three or four or five kids. Um, so this is where it has taken me. I, it has been a great journey. That is for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now I have been able to birth these two children and um, Augustus, who is a little over two and a half, is still nursing from time to time. He's on his own little weaning process. We're at that point. But it has been natural and beautiful, and it's taken its time. And so I'm getting close to a new phase of motherhood where I'm no longer pregnant or breastfeeding, which is crazy and exciting and a little bit sad and just change, but change is okay. I'm okay with that. So we'll see where it takes us next. Yes. Would you like to share your birth stories? Sure. So Miss Arcadia, who is almost five and a half, is my first. And boy, I waited for her for a long time. Um, the cards fell for me to be in the right place in my life as we, you know, try and find the perfect time for our babies. And the first month I got pregnant with her. So that was quick and easy and yay. Um, pregnancy was fairly uncomplicated. I loved being pregnant because I always wanted to be pregnant and it was mostly good, tiring, but also 
loving to look forward to finally having this child that I dreamed of forever and ever. Um, so I planned for her birth at home and had a doula and did some childbirthing classes like hypnobirthing, um, worked with a doula quite a bit and had my midwives and everything was going really well until late in the pregnancy, like 36 or 37 weeks. And my blood pressure was starting to rise. So it was getting to where most midwives start getting a little bit nervous. Mm -hmm. um, and I had two midwives at the time who worked together and one of them was still okay with it and the other one wasn't. And so I shifted to just working with the one who was okay with where things were at because I was feeling fine and just trying to listen to my own body and my own instincts. And, and thankfully that midwife was allowing me to do that. Um, when my pressure got to a point it's like 160 over 100, it was getting up there higher than any of us would like to have seen it. The midwife said, well, we've got a couple choices. We can go to the hospital for induction or we can find a way to get your pressures down. Well, let's find a way to get my pressures down because the last thing I want is to go in for an induction. My mother experienced one hospital induction um, with one of my brothers and she was like, it was not fun at all. So I did my very best to avoid that based on her experience. So went to an amazing naturopath or I'm sorry, an acupuncturist. And she was able to treat my high blood pressure and we kept it down. So for the last few weeks of my pregnancy, I continue to see her on a regular basis. She even came to my home. It was amazing. I felt better about where my pressures were at. Everybody felt better. Um, 41 weeks rolled around, which was not a surprise to me at all based on the numbers of my mother's pregnancies. And then my water broke in the middle of the night, but no labor. And it stayed like that. We started to do some homeopathics to try and get labor, labor started. All of the things that felt safe and like they might work after a couple of days of no labor, no labor. Um, we went ahead and we all got together one Saturday morning and said, okay, well, the water's been broken. You know, we've stuck to the nothing goes in your vagina after your water breaks because hello, introduction of bacteria. But even with that, the risk goes up the longer it's broken. And so, were you like trickling fluid or? Well, I had like the full sploosh. Okay. And then from there, it was trickle, 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 trickle. Mm -hmm on and on and on. Um, so we decided, well, let's try the thing that is almost for sure going to get things going. So nipple stimulation. Hours, so great. It is a little irritating, but mm. this was my last chance to labor and birth my baby at home. And so, all right, well, let's do this. So um, Tobias did most of the, the nipple stimulation. Um, it's better if it's done by a partner and go for a few minutes, wait for contraction, do it again until labor took over on its own, which took a few hours from what I recall. And then labor got going. Um, things had already been difficult for me because Arcadia was posterior. Mm -hmm. She was turning directly. So it was causing me a lot of added pain other than just like contraction, like strong contractions. Mm -hmm. There was the pain of her 
hitting parts of my body. She was not supposed to be hitting bones. Yeah. Back pain. Were you having back pain? And Oh gosh. Yeah. It was, it was awful. There's so much of it that's like kind of blocked out now. Um, but it was terribly terrific. Um, (laughs) terrifically terrible. Yes. It just, it was a lot to handle and it was hard to concentrate on anything other than the pain, even though, you know, I've been working on calming and relaxing. I could not find a comfortable position. Um, We tried the birth tub. We tried up and down and all around and just was not happening. Um, Contractions got really, really strong and really close together to the point where, you know, the lights went on and the midwife is like, hey, here's some oxygen. You need to put this on your face because apparently my color had started to change, which means the baby's changing. Um, and I just couldn't get a deep breath in between contractions anymore. It was yeah, too- you weren't getting a break, it sounds like. It was just there one were- after the other. Oof. No breaks. My body wanted to get this baby out, but because of her position, couldn't. It just, like, I was losing my energy mm-hmm. at Were you pushing at that point or not yet? Yes. I had been trying to push in the beginning. There was some like pushing, um, coaching, like this is how you push. Okay. And then they just weren't making any progresses. My, my pushes were basically going to nothing because of the position that she was in. So at some point in all of that they started an IV um, to get me some fluids to get a little bit more energy to see if maybe that would be enough for me to get this baby out Um, coming with wisdom from a second birth I wish I had just stood and had been able to go from there but even then maybe not because her head was just not in the right position and it's so hard when you're birthing for the first time this is your you know first experience you have you know even if you've witnessed other birth you don't have something to compare it to physically yourself right so unfortunately like well you, you got to be a first birther at some point right you have to have that first experience um so at that point her head was in the vaginal canal and like you could feel the top of her head but it was the wrong part of her head trying to come out it just wouldn't work mm-hmm. and I'm feeling starting to feel not as well um I was having a very difficult time keeping the oxygen on I don't do like face covering things and so I'm like no I can't I can't keep it on me freaking out and Tobias is like you have to keep this on it's for the baby it's for the baby it's for the baby so I I tried really hard and kept it on at least part of the time but part of the time I was also pushing it away at that point baby was having um some heart decelerations and it was only for a couple of minutes but it was enough combined with the whole picture that everyone in the birth team uh the midwife the doula, me, of course, Um, my husband and my mother are like, let's, let's go. It's time to go to the hospital as much as I not want to call this. Like we need to go. I threw some clothes on, waddled out the door, got uncomfortably into the back seat of Tobias's car, took in the full moon on the way there. Mm. Mm clear sky and full moon and at this point it's like two something in the morning and we are speeding to the hospital which is about 10 minutes away on a normal day maybe five that night but we got there quickly and uh, into a wheelchair and I'm laboring down the hall they get me in a room um, put me in a bed a gown I don't remember a whole lot of what was happening it's kind of a crazy blur. I know that she was born within like 30-ish minutes of getting there at 3.09. I know that she was 
born as soon as she turned. She turned when we got um, a peanut ball in between my legs and me on my side. Okay. And as soon as she turned the next contraction, she was out. Wow. And as far as I know, in that time, they had a hard time monitoring her. They couldn't really tell what her heart rate was. Um, she was born. Her cord was immediately cut, which was far from what I wanted. I wanted her to be connected as long as possible, but on my chest immediately, I didn't know the gender of my baby. Um, so this is all just happening in a fury. There are lots of people in the room. There's somebody who gathers her and puts her in an isolate and puts a tube down her throat immediately. I was like, hey, um, uh, is it a boy or a girl? <laughs> Can someone at least tell me? And I think that's when Tobias was able to take a picture and bring the picture over to me and show me it's a girl. Um, and at that moment, I was not understanding really what was happening or why they were taking her to NICU or why they had stuck a tube down her throat. Like, my baby's fine. Leave her alone. Give her to me. So I told them, okay, bring her back as soon as you can. Because sometimes they do take a baby to NICU for just a few minutes. Make sure everything is fine. And she can come back to parents fairly quickly. Um, in this case, that is not how it worked. Uh, Twice followed her up to the NICU and they did a whole bunch of tests and they said, hey, she didn't have enough oxygen for a long enough period of time that all of her organs are a mess. Her everything is injured. Her brain is very badly injured. Her everything, everything important, her vital everything. <laughs> so um, our best choice is to basically um, turn her temperature down as far as we can, put her on hypothermic protocol, which is just making her as cold as possible. Um, it makes them very sleepy and it helps with healing and it helps to prevent any more damage and so that's what we did. Of course, you know, it, it, anything we could. So for 72 hours, um, she was our little cold baby. Um, kind of crazy. They don't need any kind of sedation. They just are too cold to move around or cry or do anything. And of course, she stayed intubated so that um, she didn't have to breathe on her own. Um, I, myself, I passed the placenta and that was a slightly interesting experience. One of the doctors who was sitting and waiting for it came up and started to push on my uterus. And I was like, oh no, no, you're done with that. Cause wow, I can push this thing out yes. on, in my own time, your hands off my body. Like, I don't have to do this any faster than it's going to happen. That was that one moment where I'm like, no, I birthed my baby. Things are not chaos right now. Do not touch me. Yes. Did he respect that? He did. Good. He did. He stepped right back. Just like, okay, we'll wait. Um, I needed to have a little bit of a repair. So he did that after the placenta was passed. He moved to another room. I got in a wheelchair went up to NICU to meet my baby. Um, I would say, you know, that was in the first hour or so. And because my birth was not, like as the birthing person was not a medical thing, I convinced the hospitalist to release me within you know, like nine or 12 hours. I'm like, I don't need to be here. I know my pressures are still a little high. I'm in medicine. My husband's in medicine. My mom's in medicine. I have a midwife. I'm fine. Let me go. 
and he did, which was nice. I did not want to be stuck in the hospital. I got to take care of my baby. I have a million things to do. I'd already started pumping. In fact, that was one of the things I did while I was waiting for the placenta to be birthed. I'm like, let's get some colostrum to this baby. Um, she, of course, couldn't take it right away, but we put it away for later use. So that was nice, just get out of the hospital, be able to spend time in NICU with Arcadia. Um, it was just a waiting game for those first few days. And then she started breathing over uh, the tube that was in her throat. And that happened as well as the warming process, which takes about 12 hours. So it was... Uh, I don't know, around 86 hours, not that I was counting, um, before she was extubated and starting to wake up. So they'd taken the tube out of her throat and taken some of the wires off of her. Um, that was when I got to hold her for the first time. Mm. That was obviously a big deal for everybody. Um, it took, gosh, a few more days before her, the swelling had gone down in her face because she had been in the canal for so long that her eyes were swollen shut for, I think, seven or eight days. It, it was quite a while. Um, but being able to hold her was a big deal. Five days was a big deal because they redid like MRI, CAT scan, all of that. And unfortunately, it was kind of a rough day because... The neurologist came in and said, boy, uh, your baby's brain got a lot of damage and pointed to all the places where the white showed on the scan. And her prognosis was something like, hopefully she'll walk or talk or eat, <clears throat> excuse me, at any point. In her life, um, there's a really big chance of cerebral palsy. Um, a lot, a lot of things could happen because of how badly her brain was affected. The rest of her organs were healing really well, um, but once again, you just had to wait and see what was going to happen next. We couldn't feed her anything until she was seven days old because her stomach needed enough time to heal so that once it got food in it, it wouldn't just, horrible things wouldn't happen. Um, if you feed them too soon, then it doesn't digest and stays there and causes lots of problems and surgeries. And thankfully, uh, we waited long enough and started little tiny feeds. We started bottle feeds. Um, on day seven and a nurse was the first one to feed her and the nurse cried when she fed her because Arcadia immediately took the bottle. Having uh, the sucking reflex was a huge deal and then being able to swallow on her own like oh my gosh this is amazing. So that was a big day. Um, she, however, would not take the breast. So that was stressful to me. I'm like, oh, all this other stuff has already happened. And now she doesn't want to take my breast. I'm like, okay, I get it. I have big boobs. They're bigger than your head. This is probably, this is difficult. I've never done this before. You've never done this before. We're not a good combo right now. All she would do is scream at my breast. She would like, maybe try and latch sometimes we got her to latch I think one time in NICU and it was amazing and we have pictures of that of course but the rest of the time she would just scream and so I just pumped around the clock like you might not take it right now but someday maybe you will so I'm making sure that there is enough milk here for you so she took the bottle great and I just kept bringing my milk into her um she was a very difficult to soothe baby. Everyone in the NICU knew her because they would take turns coming into her room trying to get her to calm down. 
trying every trick. It was similar to um, like trying to calm a drug baby. A lot of people don't know, but drug babies are really, really difficult to handle. Um, these are having withdrawals and they have maybe some damage to their brain. Like all those things add up and just make for a very unhappy child. And so they were doing all the same tricks as they would for um, a baby whose mother had um, been using drugs during pregnancy, um, which was definitely not the case in, in this instance, but all of the same things were happening to Arcadia. So anyhow, at 16 days, she was discharged. Um, she actually was discharged way sooner than they expected her to be, but she's a strong kid and it was determined to heal. And I think that having a mother who is also determined for her child to heal is helpful. Like there's only so many things you can do, but I was doing whatever I possibly could. I think breast milk was a huge part of it. Um, and just positive vibes, whatever the energy, I was getting a lot of good energy from a lot of people healing energy and she was able to leave way sooner than we expected. So that was amazing. She came home and still wouldn't nurse. Um, we did eventually get her every day. I would try and she would scream at me. And I would cry and I would get her back to Tobias and say, okay, you know, feed your baby the bottle. She won't, she won't nurse for my breasts. Just do what you have to do. At six weeks, I got her to latch with a nipple shield, which um, is a little silicone device that covers the nipple makes it. I thought maybe my nipples were too small. It really wasn't that. It was just probably more that I'd never done it before and needed help. So at three months old, when I was having a really hard time getting her to latch again, I got to go to a lactation consultant who was amazing and got her to latch comfortably again. At four months old, I got her to latch without the nipple shield, which was the most amazing thing. And from then on until she was just over two years old, like nursing was no big deal. We had some trouble with uh, my supply around three months because I wouldn't pump because I was afraid that she wouldn't take my breast if it was quote unquote empty, which is not really a thing, but I thought it was a thing because the NICU nurses and just misinformation, there's so much to learn, but she did it, we made it. Yes, I remember how dedicated and determined you were, and I was just in awe, and I am just so proud of you, and I just think it's so amazing that you persisted and persisted, and then she was nursing, you know, she did nurse for a long time. She was, and she turned into a happy nurser, too. She was so perfectly happy, and it was like none of that other stuff had ever happened. Um, so she was able to nurse. She started crawling in about eight and a half months, which was not outside of the norm. She didn't walk until she was 16 months, which is a little bit late, but she started walking and she walked normally. She does not have cerebral palsy, which honestly is a pretty big miracle in itself because of the extent of her injuries. The fact that she has normal movement on both sides of her body is amazing. Um, but she runs, she rides a bike, she does all of the things that you would expect uh, a normal five-year-old to do even, even more like, you know, she started riding a pedal bike when she was four without ever hitting train wheels because yay balance bikes, but she's a very active child. She loves learning. Um, the only thing that maybe came from her birth injury um, is her speech delay, um, which is another thing that there's a lot to, um, but she has apraxia of speech, which is a motor planning disorder. And 
it makes it really hard for her brain to plan what she's going to say. She knows the words inside of her head, but she cannot get them out because all of the movements that are involved in speech are very complex. And in order for her to do those, she has to learn them one by one. This is how you make this sound. This is how you move it out of your mouth. This is how you put sounds together, how you put words together. And so it has already been a long journey of learning to speak and it will continue to be quite a journey. She may or may not speak similarly to most people at some point. Uh, it kind of depends upon how determined she is to do that. But a lot of people with apraxia have, they still speak at a slower rate in their adult life and it's a little bit choppy. It just sounds a little unnatural because they had to learn it from the very foundation of every single sound. Um, I have great hope for where she'll end up because she is a really hard worker. She's very determined to help other people understand her words. And she has speech therapy five times a week. Um, she has great support here and at school and through her speech therapist. And she will be someone great with or because of the things that she has been through. So. I have had a hard time accepting the difficulties that she has because I have found myself blaming her birth for the difficulties that she has with speech. And I actually recently realized that there is a possibility that it might have nothing to do with that. She may have healed the things that happened to her at birth and this may just be a thing that was going to happen anyways and this happened like literally a week ago when i was driving my car and had this epiphany like guess what mom it might not be your fault and that has been a weight that no one else could lift from my shoulders only I could have that moment where I realized that I might not have had anything to do with this. Like, this is just a thing that nature, that just happens. Um, there are quite a few children in my family who have had speech disorders, none of them as severe as hers, but one at least that's very similar. And she didn't have a brain injury at birth. So even knowing that there's a possibility that it wasn't my fault mm -hmm. has been really relieving. Good. Good. But How was powerful. A, yes, it was a crazy day when I'm just driving along and, huh, maybe it just is. And in, you know, in the end, it doesn't matter whose fault it is, but you can't tell a mom that. I mean, you can, but they won't listen to you. Right. Will they? No. <laughs> um, yeah. We don't believe you. Yeah. We will only believe ourselves as with, with many things as we learn throughout life. Mm -hmm. So Augustus was conceived around the time Arcadia was turning, just about to turn two years old. And that's right around when she weaned, when I was about eight weeks pregnant, I think my milk was changing or less of it. And she was just kind of done. So ended her nursing journey in the beginning of my pregnancy with Augustus, um, which was a little bit rougher. I had a young kid who brought more viruses to my life. And so I was really ill a couple of times. Um, once so much that I was afraid I needed to be in the hospital because my lungs were having trouble. And 
Um, I was able to treat that with the, the help of my midwife, the same one that I had birthed Arcadia with. Um, managed to get through that and the rest of the pregnancy, minus a couple of other normal like cold viruses, was fine. I loved being pregnant with him again. It was absolutely lovely. I knew there was something different. We also didn't know gender with him, but um, I could feel that my hormones were different. And so like, yeah, maybe it's a boy. I wanted two girls, but maybe it's a boy. I guess we'll see when it's born. Um, I ended up being pregnant with him for 43 weeks and two days. At 43 weeks, I went into labor with them, which was just enough to save me from being kicked off the midwife service because at some point they have to, in these days, these current times, they have to say, okay, well, you've gone too long. We have to give you to a different provider because the law says so. Not because they're not competent enough to handle it anymore, but because the law says so. Arbitrary numbers arbitrary things. So I went into labor at about midnight. Um, he was born on the 29th of June. So 45 hours before that, whatever day it was turning to the 27th or 28th. Anyways, it was a long time, 45 hours. You're such a trooper. The 43 weeks seems like nothing at that point. I'm like, oh, people ask me, oh, how did you stay pregnant for so long? Well, honestly, it wasn't that big of a deal. I didn't mind being pregnant at all. Mm -hmm. Any bigger or more pregnant than I had at 37 or 40 weeks. It's just not a big deal. And I really, truly believed in my body and my baby to tell me when it was time. And it did. I did have a small bit of doubt because I had to get Arcadia out um, and had to be induced at home for that. But I was able to labor and birth him naturally at home in his own time, very long time. Um, 45 hours is a long time for labor. And, and to be awake for that long, like... Yes, because some people can sleep during labor or like mm-hmm. take little naps, but it did not, it did not work for me. There was none of that. Um, of course, you know, it started in the middle of the night, so I was trying to rest, but by about five o'clock, I went ahead and called my midwife and was like, hey, this is happening. Yay. Um, I don't think I, that you need to come yet. It was actually another 24 hours after that before I called and said, Hey, you know, I think I'm actually going to have a baby today. So that would have been on the 29th. Called them around five o'clock in the morning. Hey, these are getting stronger and closer. I had my mom spend the night the night before. Um, My mother-in-law was already here as she's from out of town. So everybody was pretty much here and ready. And a couple hours later, Everybody arrives. I had a birth photographer and midwife and the midwife's assistant. And my labor was like, hey, there are people here. You could stop now. So my contractions spread out to like 10 or 15 minutes apart. And after a few hours, I said, everybody, go home. Just go home. I can't do this with you here. I'm done. I'm done being in labor. I'm not having this baby today. I'm too tired. My body hurts too much. Just go away. Let me take a nap. I'm going to try and take a nap. My contraction sped up. No, nope, I'm done. I will not do this today. And so I went to get in a hot tub to stop my contractions. I'm like, if I just go in the hot tub, it'll, it'll, it'll be fine. Got in the hot tub and they just got stronger and stronger. Like, oh my goodness. So this is about two o'clock in the afternoon at this point. And I remember seeing the looks on my mom and my mother-in-law's faces and they're like, oh God, 
gosh, that does not look fun at all. They're just feeling all the feels. And I'm thinking, nope, it's not fun. It's not fun at all. So around three o'clock, I think we went ahead and had everybody come back. I'm like, I have done all these things to try and stop labor and it's not stopping. So let's just try and do this thing. The next few hours, we blew up the birth tub and filled it up and spent some time there. And I was having a more difficult time dealing with the pain and, you know, maybe feeling a little bit tired, understandable after all that time and, and just the, the pain. Um, it was unfortunate that I was feeling pain. I know some women give birth without like the actual feeling of pain, but it was not like happy, you can relax, contractions. I was not relaxed during contractions. Um, I wanted to be really badly. I wanted it to not hurt. Um, I wanted to be able to like move myself to another place, but instead I just stayed with it. Like this is happening and I will birth this baby at some point. I didn't tell anybody, but I was so ready to go to the hospital and just be cut open. Like, let's just do this. I'm done. Take this baby out. But I never spoke that out loud because I know that I manifest things and that one's an easy one to manifest. You're like, Hey, I'm done. Like, let's just do this. Um, but I just kept on and, uh, I don't know exactly what point it was, but sometime that afternoon, uh, your husband came over to try and help with some of my pain. Uh, so we came and did some massages on my lower back and tried um, like pressure things and showed Tobias how to do some things to try and relieve the pressure. And then somewhere around bedtime, he switched out with you. Um, and that was amazing because I needed you in my space. That was like, seriously, mm -hmm. it really, it really, really was. I believe you saved me from going to the hospital, which was a really, really big deal because I did not want to be transferred to the hospital again. I did not want to go through, of course, I didn't want to go through the things I went through, but I just wanted to birth him at home. I just wanted to birth him in my space, in my time, in my way. And you came into my space and you calmed it. And I think that you fed my husband dinner um, while he was in the birth tub. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> needs to be done. Um, and then I just tuned into you. And I heard you as you breathed my contractions with me, as you made the primal sounds with me, and it kept me more present. And it just kept me like going with the process. Like, okay, one contraction at a time, one breath at a time. Um, I know that at some point we started having some trouble with the D cells on this baby too. I'm like, okay, baby number two, here we go again. So we tried the position and then um, a little bit later, shortly after, because none of us wanted to do this again, um, the midwife went ahead and broke his water um, and I wasn't able to get real good pushes in, in the birth tub. And so I got out of the birth tub somewhere in there. I got an IV again and I got oxygen on my face again, but I had prepared myself this time. I have been practicing. I had been promising myself if someone put oxygen on my face, I would keep it there and I would breathe it in deeply and I would use it to give me the power and be able to birth my baby. And so I did. I breathed it in and 
your very tall husband stood on the love seat nearby and held the IV bag up as yeah. high as he could for gravity. Well, you stood on one side of me and my mother stood on the other side of me and I had a midwife and Tobias down on the floor close by in front of me. And what I remember the most is feeling like I was going to push the two of you over into the ground because I was using you uh, to take my power and push, just to get him out. Because I knew that they were about to call an ambulance because they were not messing around this time. And it was either get him out right now or go to the hospital. And I think I said something like, I'm not doing this again, um, probably with some explicitives in there, but I didn't want to do that again. And I just wanted to do it on my own terms. So I used every bit of power there was in me and pushed that sweet boy out. And he did need a little bit of resuscitation. I recall him, um, you know, they did the little, I think of what it's called right now, but the resuscitation mask, they breathed for him for not very long. I looked down and went, oh, it has a penis. <laughs> and everybody laughed like, oh, it's, it, it's, a, it's a boy. There's a, there's a boy here. Um, the boy I never knew that I needed, but he is amazing amazing blessing um we had a great like first day at home everything was perfectly lovely we kept a really close eye on him because um you know he had a, a, a rough time there at the end and i think they decided he probably had pooped in utero and so there was possibility that you know he breathed some of that in he was perfectly fine we never had to go to the hospital no extra checkups he I was nursed. Home. He nursed. We did have a few days where I had to um, use like a syringe to get him latched. Um, but I think it was like four days in and that was over. And he has been a great nurser. He has, he made it really easy. Um, and we were able to bed share and co-sleep and it has been much more of what I had imagined for myself in mothering than my first, because I just try too hard to be what society expects out of me for my first child. Like, oh, she used to sleep in her own room and not in her bed. And I, I was still trying too hard to be somebody else. Um, and the second time around, I, no, I'm just doing it my way. This is what works for me and this is what feels right. And so that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And it has been wonderful. Yes, it was such an honor to witness you birth him and see you harness that power. And you just, you had this primal way of being wild in that moment. And you knew you were going to push him out and this story was going to be different. And it was just so powerful to witness you in that space. Such an it was, honor. It was amazing the way it, that it ended up. And I'm so, so glad that you were fated to be there. It really, really made a huge difference. It all just kind of worked out in timing. Yeah, it wasn't part of the plan, but yeah. No, no, but I'm so glad for your willingness to be there and save us a hospital trip who knows but yes I mean it I'm did. on I'm honored that that's how you feel absolutely it 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 changed it changed how that story went it did absolutely I'm quite convinced of that <laughs> and that's what matters yes and his postpartum, how was that for you? Sleeping and sleep deprivation. I know this is something you and I talk about a lot because I have, yeah, a 10 month old now and I'm just sort of coming out of this like fog of sleep deprivation for months. Um, yeah, how was that for you postpartum sleep? So sleep is a little bit better. Uh, well, probably a lot better compared to the first time actually, um, just because like 
he nursed, I slept, I flipped over, he nursed on the other side. Um, he liked to sleep in his own bed that was next to my bed for some of the time. And as he got older, he'd like to sleep there more and more. And eventually it was just like, let me nurse, put me back in my bed, which worked out just fine. It was this like perfect evolution to him going and sleeping in his own bed. So that was better, but even with that, I still had a really hard time with postpartum depression. His actually took like four or five months to hit. When it hit, it hit really hard. Um, and it wasn't necessarily the sleep deprivation. This time it was just, I don't know, everything. Mm-hmm. Everything kind of caved in at once. And it was really very difficult. I think that was when I determined, oh my goodness, I could never, I couldn't, I cannot do this again. I don't think that I was meant to do this again. Two times is really hard. Let's not do a third time. I love my little babies and my growing children, but I want to be there for them and I want to be healthy for them. Mm-hmm me two years to recover from each birth two years at the two-year mark I'm good but it's a long two years and three including a pregnancy and you know with still breastfeeding there's still some more time added on there but it was it was very difficult and I had more people around I had more help with the second one I asked for more help with the second one, but there were other difficulties that presented themselves in life. Um, About six months after he was born, I started to have relationship problems and that made everything even more difficult. Yeah. Like when your meter is like already to here to add anything else is just like, can yeah, be too much. Yeah. So surviving those months um, was difficult some days, for sure. But coming out from those, um, it's been about two years since those issues started. A lot has happened, and I am a much different person than I was then and feel pretty amazing in who I am now because I've done so much I think some people would call it soul searching some people would just call it personal work but so much ego work so much diving deep into the person I was born to be and not the person I thought I needed to be in order to be loved yes I love how you put that it's amazing amazing and my, my love for myself is probably what it was as, as a child, because children think they're pretty great until someone tells them they're not, or they feel like they're not. And so it's very empowering as an adult to be able to feel that and just know how amazing you are. Yes, you are amazing. Yes. Before we wrap up today, I wonder if you would share your current soul stirrings. Oh, yes. So recently, uh, we're listening to some uh, podcasts, which I can't think to name right at the moment, but several different podcasts about um, just women and menstruation and um, womanhood, learning to listen to your body, listen to your cycle, being able to know like what part of your cycle you're in, uh, how that feels physically and spiritually and how like maybe you eat different foods or you have different energy. I had a realization that I would like to find a way to help young women be birthed from girls into leading people. And I think there's a really big need for it. I definitely could have used it as a child. And I know almost everyone my age has a similar story about 
how they knew nothing or very, very little about menstruation before they started bleeding. And when they started bleeding, they were handed some pads or some pads and some tampons and go be crabby somewhere else. Like a lot of disrespect around periods and around bleeding and how it's shame. So much shame. And I don't want to live in a world like that. I want to live in a world that respects the woman and her body and how that blood was meant to feed a baby and grow a baby and it's sacred and I believe that I can have a hand in changing the narrative around periods around bleeding around women and I think it's really really incredibly important and it needs to start now so I'm kind of just going with the flow, uh, but also pushing myself a little bit into like writing down some ideas and getting started maybe on a YouTube channel or writing a book. I have a million other things going on, but this one is, it really is stirring my soul. It really helps me find a way to empower other women and other girls who will be the women who run this world and it needs to be done so I have found a passion um, and it works along with my already career of teaching and I think it's going to be amazing Yes, I am so excited to see what these soul stirrings birth in you and in the world as you create the world that you want to live in and for your daughters and our daughters and the daughters of the world. And I'm just so excited. And thank you so much for being here today and for sharing your impactful, beautiful stories with us. Thank you for having me. It is amazing and therapeutic to share stories. And I'm glad that we have the chance to do so. Yes. And I will include some links in the show notes of um, apraxia, if people don't know what that is, and also maybe some of these podcasts that you've been listening to, I can link them there so that people can access them if they would like to stir their soul with some of that knowledge. Perfect. All right.